and a big cheerful hello to all you listeners old and new vango vango i begin with a quote by franz kafka the czech author he said very pithily and succinctly paths are made by walking i repeat paths are made by walking we'll get to that a little later but here we go again it's the month of august a season between summer grishma and the upcoming monsoons varsha welcome to anita says this is the august podcast this is also the season when many in south india take to health resorts and ayurvedic centers to strengthen their immune systems because it is believed that it is a very important time when the rays of the sun weakens and our bodies become most susceptible to infections and illness so wherever you are i hope you're well in good health and taking the time to listen to this month's edition of anita says i'm anita ratnam and this is a monthly capture of my personal views on what's happening shifting and changing in the global landscape of indian dance traditions what can i say but the grand spectacle of the opening ceremony of the paris olympics now i'm well aware of the multiple performances arangetrams showcases festivals outdoor events and dance gatherings that have continued and will continue through the months before and after however i have to begin with the magnificent opening ceremony of the paris olympics now instead of a traditional stadium opening the french organizers chose the iconic seine river to celebrate the hundreds of sports champions french inspired music and dance numbers as thousands gathered and cheered along the banks of the waters despite the terrorist train attack on the same day the sight of a glowing celine dion the french canadian singer performing against the eiffel towers was a fabulous reminder of her strength and courage succeeding against multiple near fatal health challenges lady gaga also did not disappoint with her nod to cabaret with giant pink feathers in her opening act The rumble and anger against several drag and transgender performers imitating the last supper image of Jesus Christ made iconic by Leonardo da Vinci is still a flame on social media but the games have already begun. The Indian contingent made headlines even before the sports events began. The team's fashion outfits designed by Tarun Tehliani came under heavy criticism for their lack of imagination and failure to showcase India's diverse and glorious textile skills. The India Pavilion was launched for the first time at the Olympic Village and featured several folk performers and Bollywood singers. At the time of this recording, India has won its sole Olympic medal, a bronze for air pistol shooting by 22-year-old Manu Bhakar. You're listening to Anita Says, a monthly capture of the global world of Indian South Asian dance. Dance made headlines even before the games began. Hundreds of dancers contracted for the opening event went on strike, complaining about poor food, poor living conditions and low wages. At the last minute, an agreement was reached to send the dancers back onto the boats for the spectacular spectacular opening event. It seems that anywhere and everywhere in the world, dancers are made to work the hardest for long hours and are mostly taken for granted as puppets and mere bodies to be pushed around and rearranged. But not all hope is lost for dancers if they are fortunate to have the ideal patron. On Guru Purnima Day, July 21st, a privileged group of dancers were acknowledged, supported and applauded for their performance at the NMACC Ambani Center in Mumbai. On the specific request of cultural zarina Neeta Ambani, Bharatanatyam choreographer Rama Vaidyanathan mounted a successful work called Nimagna, Immersion, with 25 students. 
Imagine being hosted for five days, given three days of tech support, sets created as per prior specification, and a team that adheres to international standards. A house full show with a prolonged standing ovation was icing on the cake. The double bill that evening was with Odissi artist Ratikant Mohapatra and his troupe, and this was an added bonus for the delighted audience. After film star Shobana, who commanded a house full show at the Grand Theatre a few months ago, this is the second classical dance event at the 2000 seater space. You're listening to Anita Says, a monthly podcast on all that's happening in the world of Indian dance worldwide. And I am Anita Ratnam. Meow, cat ladies. I bring this up because when Republican Vice President nominee J.D. Vance made a misogynistic comment about U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris being a, quote, childless cat lady with no stake in the future of America, the internet exploded in fury. Even in our culture and other traditional societies, a woman's role is never complete unless she becomes a mother. I think about the numerous dancers, musicians and creative women who have focused on their careers and who have chosen either to remain single or, if in a relationship, have made a conscious decision not to become a parent. I know how much time parenting takes away from my own creative arc because I've been told numerous times that children are a, quote, distraction and that I would have progressed much further in my artistic career if I had been single without children. While I can disagree vigorously with this observation since I love my role as a mother, I feel that these are purely personal choices to punish or penalize women for their independent views and life decisions is totally unacceptable. So, hello cat ladies, Malavika, Varli, Chitra, Sonal, Padma, Ananda, Sonali, Swarnamalia and everyone who continue to make important personal choices that suit your life map. We love you. And the always amazing Alarmel Valli made a brief and rare dance appearance during the Chennai book launch of her dear friend poet Arundhati Subramaniam's Wild Women. It was a lovely morning event in Chennai, a departure from the usual boring book releases. An added treat was seeing a recovered Bombay Jayshri Ramnath looking weak but well, receiving the first copy. Her fans will recall her harrowing illness in Liverpool, UK, two years ago and the long road back to recovery. Welcome back, Jayshree. You're listening to Anita Says, a monthly podcast about Indian dance and I'm Anita Ratnam. A two-hour drive along the coast from Chennai brought me to the new dance and creative crucible of Sakhi, a dream project of Shijit Nambiar and Parvati Menon. It is a soft and idyllic locale, still remote and inaccessible to city comforts, but with a great potential to become another Adi Shakti-like space for dreaming and dancing. In a long conversation with young dancers from several countries, I tried to project a practical roadmap of how to navigate the enormous challenges that young artists face. Money, opportunity, recognition, Everyone in the session was clamoring for a piece of the pie. Everyone was conflicted about having a side hustle, a side job or vocation that could support their dance passion. Somehow, today's young students have been told that if their mind was diverted from the daily rigor of practice, that they cannot be, quote, pure artists. This is misleading and can harm the young hopeful mind. Senior gurus and star mentors are doing a great disservice by drilling this outdated mantra to Gen Z. This is not rocket science. Dance needs money. I stress to each student that they had to find a skill that brings in the moolah, that can then support the dancing. It's that simple. Today, a young dancer needs to think of a job and dance, or at least dance and something else. Not just dance, 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 more dance. This will lead to heartbreak and disappointment. You're listening to Anita Says, a podcast about Indian dance, and I'm Anita Ratnam. 
there is an increasing pushback against traditional myths and ancient stories. Young students of dance are clashing with their teachers about the inappropriate or unsuitable nature of some familiar tales. Greek, Indian, Indonesian, Mayan, Celtic and other ancient societies are replete with numerous narratives that carry messages of cultural, environmental, identity and other issues that do not fit snugly on today's contemporary society. Now let me give you some examples. Princess Sita, who curses the Tulasi bush for not speaking the truth when asked and thereby denying it of all fragrance. Is this upper caste oppression? Lord Krishna and Arjuna, who in the Mahabharata burn the Khandava forest to help the fire god Agni and displace the indigenous peoples of the land by doing so. Is this corporate greed? Prince Arjuna, who assumes the disguise of the female dance teacher Brahannala, is this identity appropriation? Lord Zeus, in Greek mythology, who is accused of every horrific misdemeanor like rape, incest, warmongering, he's a perfect candidate for cancel culture. And handsome Lord Muruga himself as an old man, teasing the indigenous mountain princess Valli, a classic case of Eve teasing. Now, one young student in the USA complained about Lord Muruga's behaviour to her guru. It's Eve teasing, ma'am, she said. I don't want to learn the Shabdam. The Guru then was feeling very pressured because this was the time-honoured tale of how Muruga married Valli. While posing this dilemma to me, she asked me what her response should be. My advice to her was, first tell all her students about these traditional tales. Sometimes, these stories and a brave teacher can tweak and subvert this narrative. Now, Princess Varli can turn the tables on Lord Murugan and tease him instead. But as a last resort, this item can be avoided because it might make both the guru and the student uncomfortable. Teach them something else. There are growing cases of doubts and questions for today's generation of classical dance students in India and among the diaspora. In the end, the teaching and learning of dance must be mutually joyous, productive, and a positive experience. India's contemporary dance community often look down on these narratives as tired, old-fashioned, and completely out of sync with the times. Perhaps, but these are the stories that have and continue to inspire so many creative people in the performing and visual arts. Speaking of classrooms and dance teachers, scholar Adya Katikar has done an extensive study about the social position of dance teachers in India's educational system, in contrast to the respect given to sports coaches and other staff in the extracurricular activity sector. Adya feels that the dance teacher employed by schools and colleges are at the lowest rung of the ladder. Unless one has an independent dance academy, she concludes, there is little respect or social standing for dance teachers in Indian schools and colleges. Here I must add that Indian politicians frequently use myths as metaphors for their arguments in Parliament. Rahul Gandhi recently compared the Congress party to the inclusive procession of Lord Shiva, who invited humans, animals and creatures of all shapes and sizes into his cabinet. The opposition, he compared to the exclusive chakra view circle that was the death knell for Arjuna's son Abhimanyu and said that he and his party were going to break this deathly circle. Now these stories, images and narratives have become so deeply embedded into everyday parlance in India because the gods have become human and they're also exposed for their frailties and faults. And therein lies the magic and the mystery. You're listening to Anita Says, a podcast about shifts and events that shape the world of Indian and South Asian dance. And I'm Anita Ratnam. I ended my month in Manila, Philippines with the IFTR Theatre Conference. This theatre conclave is held in several cities across the world, mainly on university campuses during the annual summer vacation. I consider myself an IFTR veteran, having attended five previous conferences in many interesting cities across the globe. This year's theme was titled States of Emergency. 
My joint presentation was with Dr. Ketu Katrak of the University of California, Irvine, and was about the Chennai floods in 2015 and 2023 and how the artistic community rallied to support their colleagues in distress. Ketu spoke about the dire lack of sanitation and water in South African projects and in the slums of Dharavi in Mumbai. At the same conference, emerging scholar dancer Amrita Shruti Radhakrishnan presented her thoughts on ecologies of presenting dance festivals in times of climate instability. Amrita focused on the Serendipity Festival in Goa as her center point. A bright and engaging mind who has the advantage of being a Bharatanatyam performer and now segueing smoothly into scholarship, Dr. Amrita Shruti is a welcome voice and a discerning mind to the fractured dance landscape. What Indian dance needs today are more bright and questioning minds like Amrita and Adya, who are both affiliated to the Shiv Nadar University in Delhi NCR. Students and scholars who are willing to stay engaged while debating, disagreeing, arguing and yet staying in the conversation. Even seniors like myself need these frequent checkpoints to stay alert to privileges and tightly held opinions. Intergenerational connections and discussions are the need of the hour. Meanwhile, enjoy the spectacle of the Paris Olympics. Cheer the amazing spirit, tenacity and grit of the athletes. As breakdancing and hip-hop make their premiere in Paris as a dance sport, we look forward to more barriers crumbling between performance and athleticism and the growing exhilaration at the wonders and possibilities of the human body. Like the opening quote by Czech author Franz Kafka, one has to do the dance. One has to walk the path. You have to dance, play, compete in order to walk the path. It cannot happen by thinking, dreaming, talking, arguing and procrastinating. What did he say? He said, paths are made by walking, not by dreaming. So, with best wishes to all of you for continuing good health I wish you all a wonderful August. Until we meet again, thank you so much for tuning in to this podcast, Anita Says. Do share, subscribe and send us your comments. Tell us about what you would like me to discuss in the coming episodes. Signing off from the Digi Sound Studio in Chennai, I'm Anita Ratnam. <laughs>